Thank you. So, uh, may I welcome all of you to this very, very interesting symposium on uh, psychosis onset and drug abuse. We had nice papers recently giving very nice uh, new research results on, for example, cannabis and the impact on psychosis onset. And we will hear today uh, cutting edge research on this topic. I'm very, very curious myself what we hear. So the first to start is Stefan Borgwart. He is a um, professor in Basel, a former co-worker of mine there, has his own research group now and his own clinic. He is mainly working with neuroimaging and he will present the Basel results from the early detection center in Baal. Chef. So hello everybody. Uh, thanks uh, to the two chairs for inviting me. So my talk will be about um, neuroimaging results um, in people uh, in their earliest stages of psychosis with regard to substance abuse. So I will very briefly start with the staging model of psychosis. I'm clearly aware that you are aware of this topic very well. But then I will show you a few um, results regarding cognitive deficits in early psychosis because they are very much linked to uh, some of the substance uh, misuse disorders um, uh, coming across with early psychosis. And then I will give you a short overview how many of the, per of the subjects at high risk uh, really consume uh, other substances. And then I will come to the imaging findings, which we have to understand in the context of um, effects of substances as cannabis. So you know all this model. I, I'd like to focus that I will mainly speak about the period um, in the age of 15 till 25. So in this um, age range, uh, our patients have several changes in brain structure and brain function, and I will um, show you a few studies that uh, had influences or investigated influences of substances in this period of life. So when I speak about ultra high risk subjects or uh, subjects at, um, at with an at risk mental state or at ultra high risk, it's basically more or less the same and it addresses people uh, who have either brief limited intermittent psychotic symptoms, so it means that they have clear psychotic symptoms which only last um, a few days and then remit without any kind of treatment. Or people with so-called attenuated psychotic symptoms, meaning people who experience uh, hallucinations or delusions, but they do not fulfill uh, criteria for full-blown psychosis. Um, looking at the ultra-high risk patients, it's important to note that uh, when we speak about ultra-high risk patients, it means that only one-third of these people will uh, finally experience a psychotic episode. So um, in a meta-analysis, um, it's been shown that only 35% of those people uh, develop a psychotic episode. And this doesn't mean that they all develop schizophrenia. This also includes people with bipolar disorder. So you can judge for yourself that this is a very high number or actually a slow number. But having in mind when we, spoke, when we speak about uh, ultra-high risk subjects, it's important that two-thirds of these people will probably not develop a psychotic episode. That doesn't mean that there are healthy people, they all need psychiatric treatment and for longer times as well, but you have to have this in mind that we don't speak about schizophrenia patients at this stage. So apart from um, their 
psychopathology, they also suffer from cognitive deficits. And in a meta-analysis of about uh, 1,000 high-risk subjects, we've seen that compared to controls, these high-risk subjects have cognitive deficits in almost all cognitive domains. You can have a look that uh, spans executive functioning, verbal fluency, attention, and different memory domains. And those people who later really develop a psychotic episode, those high risk with later transition, have more severe cognitive deficits than those who do not. Um, so this um, meta-analysis provided evidence for these widespread cognitive deficits in ultra-high-risk patients. And, but there were some limitations, and apart from um, publication bias and so on, antipsychotics, which we could address, there was one, um, one issue of substance use. And also, we had a uh, specific look at this, it was impossible to address this issue in this meta-analysis. And I think this is a, a common pattern which we will see in later or in other meta-analysis as well, that it's very different, uh, very difficult to address the effects of substance abuse. I mean, in a clinical setting or from clinical experience, we, we are all aware of this problem to say, are these symptoms uh, really due to substances or are they driven by the psychotic disease itself? So I'm sure you're aware of this paper which has been published last year. It's a, a paper by Jean Eddington's group and she investigated with the Naples sample more than 700 clinical high-risk subjects compared to controls. And what they basically found were, were that ultra-high-risk subjects had a higher use of cannabis and of tobacco than controls. You can have a look at here. So let's say abstinent, so 76% of all uh, high-risk subjects were abstinent from cannabis, whereas 90% of the controls, and again, tobacco, roughly the same numbers. It's different to all other drugs. They also investigated alcohol, cocaine, and so on, but there were no uh, difference in the use of these substances between ultra-high risk subjects and controls. Interestingly, this pattern persists over one year follow-up, and uh, there was no difference at baseline regarding later transition. So you couldn't say that those people who consumed more cannabis were more likely to develop a psychotic episode. But this clearly states that there is higher use of cannabis and tobacco in uh, ultra-high risk subjects. So why is it important to study uh, cannabis? And it's a most widely used illegal drug worldwide. And the effects of one of the 40 cannabinoids, which are in uh, cannabis, THC, is mediated by cannabinoid 1 receptors. And they are in particular uh, common in certain brain a, a brain areas as anterior cingulate, prefrontal cortex, and mediotemporal cortex, all uh, brain areas which are implicated in schizophrenia and in the ultra high risk state. So in Basel, um, we had a look at um, the use of cannabis with regard to cognitive functioning. And also, we had the hypothesis that there is a clear link. Uh, there were no differences between former, current, and never users, and furthermore, no impact of frequency of cannabis use on cognitive functioning. So in our sample, um, which is relatively small compared, of course, to the uh, Naples sample, we couldn't establish these findings. However, now I come to the results of the imaging findings in early psychosis. So why do we do uh, imaging at all, because we are interested to bridge the gap between specific syndromes within the psychotic uh, disease as schizophrenia here, working memory, 
or other syndromes bridge the gap between what we deal with as clinicians and the genetic basis. And we did one uh, systematic review and looked at structural imaging findings in the high-risk patients and in the um, patients having an established uh, schizophrenia. And we had also a look into post-mortem studies with regard to effects of cannabis. And what we found is a rather general um, uh, finding that relatively consistent brain structural abnormalities in those cannabinoid one receptor enhanced brain regions as the cingulate cortex and prefrontal cortices. And in these regions, patients who were consuming cannabis had lower volumes. Interestingly, no effects of cannabis use was found in the post-mortem studies. Uh, there were only a few published at this time, and so the post-mortem studies couldn't um, support the findings of the imaging results. Um, going now further from um, established schizophrenia now to first episode uh, schizophrenia, there was one uh, study published uh, from Rene Kahn's group in 2008, and they found reduced gray matter volume in cannabis using first episode schizophrenia patients uh, compared to patients not using cannabis compared to non using cannabis healthy controls. And as expected, the other way around with larger ventricles in the cannabis using patients um, compared to controls and compared to patients not using cannabis. So we found obviously uh, cannabis related or cannabis more pronounced uh, brain structural abnormalities in schizophrenia patients already in their first episode. But the question is how this is linked to the development uh, and the onset of psychosis. So um, the very first study looking at the transition of psychosis with, with regard to gray matter volume was published by Chris Pantelis and Philip McGuire now uh, almost 15 years or uh, 13 years ago. And this showed reduced gray matter volume before the onset of psychosis in certain brain regions, again, uh, prefrontal cortex and cingulate cortex. And this is even more pronounced during the actual transition. So there was a, a longitudinal part of the study uh, looking, at the, uh, looking at the specific effects during the transition phase. But the question is how these findings are related to cannabis use. And in Basel, we had a look at um, the cingulate volume in ultra high risk patients or atrous mental state patients and first episode patients. And we corrected for age, gender, alcohol consumption. I come later to it because this is maybe crucial. And whole brain volume and medication, of course. And we found a negative effect of cannabis use on the um, posterior cingulate volume bilaterally and the anterior cingulate volume on uh, the left hemisphere. And there was a negative association of current cannabis use with the gray matter volume of the cingulate cortex. And again, this, this region is very rich of cannabinoid 1 receptors. So we assume that both uh, atrous mental state patients and first episode patients were particularly sensitive to exogenous activation of these cannabinoid 1 receptors. So how, how can this happen or what's the underlying uh, biological basis? So there were a few or there are a few hypotheses and findings around. Uh, one is that the hippocampal neurogenesis or maturation is uh, in particular affected during the adolescent period. Um, then uh, synaptic plasticity is affected by cannabis or direct neurotoxic effects of cannabis via increased nerve growth factor uh, levels. <coughs> 
and Caspi et al. suggested a more complex understanding of genetic environment interactions. So, and then um, this year, this is, I think, a very important uh, paper as well. This was published recently by Jean Eddington's group and is uh, our results from the Naples study again. So you see the impressive number of clinical high-risk subjects. And again, they uh, were interested in the relation between cannabis use, misuse, and certain subcortical volumes. And what they did, they compared at first ultra-high risk subjects with cannabis consume and without compared to controls. It's important to note that all controls had no cannabis use. So obviously the study would have been better if they had also included cannabis using uh, healthy controls. So this is one major limitation. Maybe we can discuss this later. But when, we, when they compared these ultra-high risk uh, with cannabis versus, uh, versus without cannabis, they found a difference in hippocampal volume and in am amygdala volume. The dotted line is the uh, volume of the healthy controls. But then, in a later stage, they only included those high-risk subjects who had only a moderate alcohol consume. And then, uh, the significant difference between the amygdala disappeared, this is non-significant now, and only the hippocampal difference um, in hippocampal volume uh, survived. So, and they so apart from their main finding that smaller hippocampi in users versus non-users in ultra-high risk, uh, which is interesting enough, they also suggested that it's very important to control for effects of alcohol. And their assumption is that many effects we see in, uh, or which we uh, understand as effects of cannabis, may be related to alcohol or other substances. Um, actually, I, I intended to talk about uh, functional imaging studies as well. So in your abstract, they are mentioned. But I could only find actually this one study who specifically addressed the issue of cannabis. There are other studies around, but at least I found only this study. And they concluded that also a younger age at onset of uh, cannabis use was associated with connectivity between the thalamus and cortical regions, cannabis itself used does not appear to be identifying characteristic for thalamic connectivity. So basically this um, connectivity study did not really confirm the structural imaging studies. But it's important to note that uh, this kind of resting state analysis, in particular of connectivity analysis, is rather complex, and maybe this is also due to methodological reasons. So, yeah, summary is that there is uh, the fact that cannabis use is associated with volume loss of global and specific brain regions. I mentioned the cingulate and the hippocampus. And uh, psychosis patients and high-risk patients may be in particular vulnerable to brain volume loss due to cannabis exposure and controlling for effects of alcohol and possibly tobacco is crucial. What are the next steps? Um, I think one interesting thing is uh, can we assess the potential differential effects of phytocannabinoids. Uh, I guess Marta Di Forti will uh, say something about this issue, but I'm not aware if there are any studies looking at brain structure and uh, effects of THC versus, for instance, CBD. And very important to know that future studies should not just address cannabis effects, they should also address the effects of other substances, in particular interaction effects of multiple substance use. And I missed some functional imaging studies. 
and obviously only large scale projects as Naples or as SciScan, maybe Pronia as well, uh, may address uh, these rather complex questions of interactions between uh, certain uh, substances. So I'd like to thank you for your patience and of course the patients and volunteers of the studies in Basel and around. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Stefan, for this very comprehensive and elegant uh, presentation. Is there any question? So I'm ask you, oh, please. Thank you. I, I was just wondering, Stefan, when you say you should control for alcohol and, and uh, tobacco use, uh, most what people will use all three. So how, how, how would you go about doing that? Because yeah. I can only say what uh, the group of Eddington did. She controlled in a mean that they excluded all subjects who said that they would also use alcohol in a high dosage. So they, I think in their first analysis, they included, I think, 200 out of 300, and then they had to reduce it to 100. So basically, they excluded all patients that were only consuming alcohol in a higher dosage. So what, what do you suggest to co I mean, I think another opportunity which we did in, in Basel, we co-varied uh, for the effect of, uh, of alcohol. But I'm not sure if we can really address these potential interaction effects of alcohol and cannabis. I think the only solution is to exclude the subjects who uh, consume uh, higher dosages of alcohol and tobacco. But I think it really depends on, on the frequency of the use. I mean, tobacco, I think 90% or of all patients uh, take uh, tobacco, and um, so it's, it's difficult to find uh, the necessary sample sizes. And I was a little bit surprised about the, uh, the number of cannabis abstinent people in the clinical high risk. Users also. I think in this study, in the Naples study, it was only one or two percent. That was a very low number. I think it really depends on the inclusion criteria of your study. Would you regard these patients as um, actually substance misuse disorder which have uh, and these people have some psychotic symptoms regarded as clearly dri driven by the substance or if you regard this patient as mainly uh, having a psychotic disorder which also consumes some of these substances. Is Anita? In Basel we excluded uh, these patients on other drugs so we can't say anything, really. There might be one or the other, which... That, that was American. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was American sample, was one to two okay. percent. Okay. okay. Any other question from the audience? So thank you, Stefan, again. Thank you. So let me move on with the second speaker. It's my pleasure to introduce Professor Mirella Ruggeri from Verona, from the University of Verona. Uh, who was uh, just alerted uh, yesterday by myself uh, because uh, yeah, uh, Schifano couldn't be here, so she's been very kind, uh, to, uh, brilliantly, I'm sure, and she's going to present some data on the use of cannabis on some major projects that uh, she has led in the last 10 years on four stages of psychosis, such as uh, PICOS and the Get Up uh, study, which are national uh, extended uh, studies in uh, four stages of psychosis in Italy. Please, Mirella. Thank you, Paolo. I'm sure I will not be brilliant because really this piece of work is fully the merit of one of my collaborators, uh, uh, Professor Sara Tosato, uh, which is not here. However, as uh, in the title of this symposium, there was a mention uh, to real clinical life, I decided to accept uh, the kind invitation of uh, Paolo to present very quickly because I think it's better to save time for the other more focused 
speakers uh, on the theme, uh, some data from uh, one of the two um, studies on early psychosis that we have conducted in Verona, by the way, in strict collaboration with, uh, um, with Paolo. Uh, and, and please, uh, I ask, uh, I want to ap apologize uh, in, uh, in, uh, in advance just for, because I'm not really the right person for, for this, but I'll do my best. So the, the, the data I'm going to, to present relates specifically on the relationship between cannabis use and age of onset in first episode uh, psychosis. Um, it's, uh, it's well known that uh, there is an increased use of cannabis in uh, the uh, psychotic patients at first uh, episode, and there are several studies that have studied the uh, role that cannabis can play, to, uh, can play on the onset course and treatment of uh, uh, psychotic disorders. Uh, it is, mm, the phenomenon of cannabis use, uh, as Marta Di Forti will, will uh, very clearly show so with data in the frame of the UJ project, uh, is uh, influenced by a number of uh, socio-demographic characteristics and uh, like, like uh, gender, age, educational level, unstable relationship status, but also uh, it has a um, strong uh, um, dependence on the cultural uh, context. And this is also, I, I, only, I also wish to say that this study, the, the PICO study was the first study to uh, address the issue of use of cannabis in a representative uh, group of uh, uh, patients with uh, first episode psychosis. Uh, there were already in the literature uh, data uh, reporting uh, some differences in clinical presentation for abstinent or people who were uh, using, uh, uh, using cannabis, especially shorter duration of untreated psychosis, more severe positive symptoms, less severe negative symptoms, uh, and some data analyzing, in a, by the way, not in a congr completely congruent way among the different studies, the role of, uh, of mood in uh, the component of mood in uh, psychosis. To better clarify some aspects, uh, we uh, used uh, uh, data from this project that uh, has a strong focus on, uh, on outcome and on uh, evaluation of clinical characteristics at uh, onset. It's not working so properly. I go, I want to go quicker than, okay. So, which were the aims? The aims were to confirm the hypothesis that cannabis use in first episode of psychosis is associated with a higher level of positive symptoms, a lower level of depressive symptoms, uh, however is uh, the, the interpretation of this, and a better premorbid adjustment at onset. Moreover, age of onset and better premorbid IQ. And this was done in the frame of the big project that we conducted. Now we have completed the five year follow up. We conducted the project in the entire Veneto region, which is a five million inhabitant uh, catchment area. And uh, assessment of these variables on uh, drug abuse went together with a really a large number of variables measuring clinical and social outcome and uh, uh, using also genetic and brain imaging uh, analysis. So uh, PICOS has been for us in Verona, but for Italy in general, and not only, one of the most comprehensive models for predicting the outcome of psychosis, integrating biological and psychosocial factors, and also uh, identifying the specific aspects which might contribute to the final outcome. This was uh, the area we asked to everybody, as it is in the, uh, all the mental centers, uh, 
uh, serving uh, the large uh, regional area to participate. This is a characteristic that the Verona Group has established throughout the year and further implemented in the frame of the Get Up project, which is asking to everybody, so not relying to interest in research or on the topic, because I th we think that the strength of our piece of research is representativeness, both of patients and of uh, services. This was our first experience. 80% of uh, the mental health centers uh, serving the area accepted. It was a high acceptance rate, which in the GetUp project, as I said yesterday, became even higher because it was 92. Uh, the domains assessed are listed here. Uh, we used uh, the traditional uh, uh, scale for alcohol and uh, uh, drug use, which allowed us to be enough specific in assessing this phenomenon. We were, of course, aware of the problem which everybody who works with cannabis and, and drug abuse knows that often patients don't tell fully the truth and that the limitation of the study, as for many of the other studies, is asking and not measuring uh, in uh, the urines and so on uh, the real, uh, the real uh, use for um, the um, cross-sectional assessment, but our assessment was uh, concerning the year previous uh, the psychosis onset. This is a schema of uh, recruitment of patients in, uh, in, uh, in the PICOS project, and uh, uh, among the almost 400 uh, patients uh, that uh, uh, were uh, accepted to complete the standardized assessment for the overall clinical variables at baseline, uh, a relatively high proportion, 311, accepted to give us information for drug and alcohol used. Uh, which were the data that we got? Uh, almost 80% of patients at first episode didn't use, as had never used the, the, any drug. Uh, among uh, those who had used some drug, cannabis use was by far the most frequent, 19%. Overall, with some comorbidity, co-use uh, for the different uh, type of drugs, the prevalence rate of drug use was 20.3%. Uh, As you see, cannabis use um, uh, constituted the, the, uh, the, the larger group of uh, uh, users. which were the social demographic characteristics which uh, identified the cannabis users from uh, the abstinence. They were, in the vast majority, male. They had a younger age at onset. Age at onset was um, um, uh, um, defined by uh, asking the patients in a um, um, articulated uh, instrument uh, when the first symptoms of psychosis had uh, uh, occurred. And uh, uh, as you can see in uh, our sample, the vast majority of uh, the younger patients, 18 uh, out of uh, till 25, uh, um, are uh, in the group of the cannabis uh, users. And the proportions instead based on the age are different between having used cannabis or not. Uh, the other characteristic which struck us was uh, that probably due uh, to the younger age, the vast majority of cannabis users were living with their own family here. You all know, I think, that which are the characteristics of living in the family which really split Europe into uh, two parts in the southern countries of Europe. Uh, um, children stay for a lot of time, and I'm very happy about that. Uh, as a mother, uh, with their parents, uh, while in uh, northern countries they tend to live alone uh, very recently. And interestingly enough, most of these uh, uh, cannabis users in the Veneto region were also single. Uh, we didn't find uh, differences in the uh, proportion of uh, the subtype, uh, dif different subtypes of, uh, um, of schizophrenia, and uh, uh, not in uh, duration of untreated psychosis, which, however, however, uh, as you see, in Italy is uh, um, uh, 
is, is low, is among uh, the lowest uh, uh, levels in, uh, me measured in, uh, in Europe and uh, in the world. Um, also, the, the use of alcohol had a different, uh, you see, distribution in uh, uh, the users and in the abstinent uh, people. We also measured psychopathology and premorbid uh, uh, adjustment in uh, cannabis uh, users. And uh, we did find that uh, in, uh, uh, in this group uh, uh, there was uh, um, a significant uh, uh, difference in uh, uh, the level of depression, which is, was lower in the cannabis uh, uh, user, uh, higher problems in uh, impulse control, and uh, our higher problems in uh, disturbance of volition. Uh, uh, in confirm to the PANS items, also the level of depression as measured specifically by the Hamilton score was significantly lower. We wanted to go more deeply in detail on uh, this issue of age of onset and we analyze here, I skip a little bit to, to be uh, we, and we analyzed with a multivariate analysis the combination, the influence of uh, gender uh, uh, diagnosis and combined gender and diagnosis on the age of onset. As you can see, the uh, younger age of onset uh, compared to the group of, on, uh, of abstinence uh, remains also after having controlled for these important variables. So quickly, uh, what, what, uh, what can we say for, from uh, this data very, very quickly? Uh, first, that uh, we have established the rate of uh, subjects with, uh, uh, which use uh, um, cannabis at, uh, in the first episode. Let me just skip because I want to save time. We have compared this rate with uh, the population uh, in the Veneto region, and this rate showed clearly to be higher in the patients at the first episode of psychosis in the year preceding the first episode. We wanted to disentangle from the entire population the subgroup of, of subjects that were uh, young, younger. Um, and uh, as you can see, this uh, proportion slightly changed because in the younger people, in the general population, the frequency of cannabis use is, however, higher than in the more old population. Uh, but also, uh, the numbers, absolute numbers or proportions increased. So in general, we found, as expected, that uh, uh, younger people use more cannabis than older people and uh, that uh, um, the, 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 the risk for psychotic patients in the younger age is further, further uh, increased. Similar tendential trend was true also for the other drug of abuse, but uh, uh, cannabis plays really a major role in Italy, in Italy too. This is a contribution that not many previous studies have done. The association between male gender and cannabis was absolutely nothing new in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, the literature. Living with a family has been already discussed, so I don't want to take your, your time. Uh, we didn't detect differences in terms of negative and positive symptoms in being abusers or not, uh, while we uh, got this uh, um, interesting confirmation of some uh, hypotheses prevailing in the literature concerning the role of depressive symptoms. Somehow, uh, it seems that uh, using cannabis is, uh, is having a a positive impact, uh, albeit through a, a method which is not uh, advisable, but on alleviating uh, the dysphoria, which is probably one of the uh, elements we stays in the background. And the, in, in this area, we have several studies on early psychosis which confirm that many of uh, the suffering of early psychosis patients derives even more than 
by the uh, positive and negative symptoms from this uh, emotional uh, disorder. Skip it, which is not such a, a crucial aspect. Uh, so earlier age of onset in the Italian sample was quite straightforward. So we think that these data support the hypothesis that this substance is triggering psychosis, at least in some vulnerable projects, in some vulnerable subjects. Uh, and it's uh, um, overall, I think it's uh, a strong prompt into uh, giving more attention to the use of this uh, drug in uh, younger people and also uh, in uh, 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 targeting treatments for comorbid use of uh, uh, cannabis in the vulnerable patients. In patients we have some uh, or premorbid signs of psychosis or vulnerability. Thank you so much. Thank you for this brilliant, really brilliant contribution. Very interesting. Any questions? Remarks? Well, you could look into your sample and see if there is any correlation between the use of neuroleptics and the use of cannabis. Uh, this is a sample which is uh, more or less uh, neuroleptic free because it's a sample at first episode and only those who had uh, um, or no treatment or at least uh, a treatment not, uh, uh, lasting not more than one month were included in the study. Okay, so, and, and they recall the period, the, la the, the previous year b before asking for help in the public sector. So these are neuroleptic free. In the outcome data, uh, this was, um, uh, the PICOS is a multi-wave uh, follow-up uh, uh, study. We have one year follow-up, two years follow-up, and, and now completed five years follow-up. We will try to get some understanding because, of course, assessment of drug abuse has continued throughout the different follow-ups, th some uh, assessment of these aspects too because there is a specific schedule measuring uh, pharmacological therapy, even if we all know that the pharmacological therapy is fluctuating, so it's not that easy to get very precise estimates, especially over the long-term run. But this is a very interesting question in, in, uh, to this extent, I think. So thank you very much. I suppose we have to go on to the next speaker. So, thank you very much for your interest and your contributions. See you later. <laughs>